On Wednesday evening, March 27, 1974, if you had driven down the streets of Salt Lake City toward the movie theaters at Trolley Square, you would have come upon an unusual sight. Salt Lake City is one of America's great cities, but it is also one of our most reserved religious and civilized cities. In 1974, as well as today, it was not known for its nightlife or noise. And yet there, on the streets of Salt Lake City, just before midnight in 1974, you would have encountered a crowd of people, all of them milling about a tall man and his wife. In most cities, the event easily might have been mistaken for an accident or a mugging. But if you had slowed your car, you would have seen that the people in the crowd, adults and children, were gently thrusting pieces of paper and books at the man. And he, in turn, was patiently autographing them. Who's that, you might have wondered? The weather-beaten face of the man did look familiar, not the way famous faces do. The fact of the matter was there had been a movie premiere, a world premiere of a movie, and many of its stars had made appearances. But the actors and the actresses had long since departed for their hotel rooms. Only the man and his wife remained. The movie was based upon and named after a book he had written, Where the Red Fern Grows. But the book and movie tell only part of the story of how that 60-year-old man, Wilson Rawls, came to be standing there on the sidewalk, signing his name under the streetlights and stars. Even if you had stopped to inquire of the crowd, hey, what's going on? You wouldn't have gotten the whole story. The whole incredible, heartwarming story. Not from the people in the crowd, at least, because few, if any of them, knew it. But the man and his wife knew the story. Oh, they certainly did. They, above all others, knew the story of Wilson Rawls's journey from the poor dirt farm in Oklahoma's Cherokee Nation to the status of celebrity author. Today, Where the Red Fern Grows is one of the best-known and most beloved children's novels of our time. Indeed, you'd be hard-pressed to find a single middle-grade classroom in America that doesn't contain someone who has read this book. Often, it would be half the class or more. Wilson Rawls was born Woodrow Wilson Rawls, September 24, 1913. He was named after the 28th President of the United States, and throughout his life, his friends always called him Woody, short for Woodrow. He died at the age of 71, December 16, 1984, a little more than 20 years after the publication of Where the Red Fern Grows. Most of his last 20 years were spent writing his second book, The Summer of the Monkeys, and visiting schools, telling children and their teachers the remarkable story behind his books, the story you are about to hear in his very own words. He was working on a third book when he died. My name is Jim Trelease. I write, lecture, and talk about children's books. Not long after I began doing this kind of work back in the 1970s, I started to hear pieces of a story about Wilson Rawls and how he'd come to write his book. Eventually, I learned that all of those anecdotes were related to a speech he was giving around the country, a speech so moving that people in the audience were repeating it almost verbatim years later, each time with tears in their eyes, each time whispering, it was the best speech I ever heard in my life. I never had the privilege of hearing Wilson Rawls give that speech in person. But after many years and many, many inquiries, I found the next best thing. I found his widow, Sophie Rawls, living quietly in retirement in Wisconsin, treasuring the memory of her husband. She also was treasuring a small box of audio cassettes, recordings of his speech made before different audiences all over America. She was kind enough to share those recordings with me. I had told her that if we could find a good enough tape, perhaps we could reproduce it and make his speech available to new generations of children and adults who loved his book, but missed out on hearing his personal story. As I listened to each tape from that box, I was disappointed to discover they were not professional recordings. The sound was off or there was background noise. Something flawed each recording. And then I came to the last tape. With my fingers crossed, I pressed the play button. And there it was, the near-perfect recording, the one that had made him sound as though he were right there with the listener, 
having a conversation around the campfire. What you are about to hear is Mr. Rawls' famous speech called Dreams Can Come True. And this particular time it was delivered to a teacher's convention. Included in the audience that day, and you'll hear references to them, were his wife and another writer for children, Walt Morey, the author of Gentle Ben. A man who struggled to become a writer had many of the same roots as Wilson Rawls. Indeed, Walt Morey repeated first grade three times and didn't learn to read until he was nearly 14 years old. And now, let's let Wilson Rawls tell his story. Now, before I go into this talk, there's a few things that I think we better get straightened out. I'm not a professional speaker, although there seem to be an awful lot of people trying to make one out of me. But I don't think I could be a professional speaker even if I wanted to. I'd have two strikes against me to begin with. One, my word vocabulary is practically zero. And I'm going to make a statement now that I don't know whether very many people would have nerve enough to make at this kind of a setting, especially English teachers. You're going to hear more grammar mistakes in one speech today than you will hear the rest of your life. <laughs> I don't think this is altogether my fault. My mother said that I was born in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I guess she must have been right. Now, you're going to hear words today in my talk that some speakers may say they're not very appropriate words for a speaker to use, but I don't care what other speakers has to say. They're the only kind of words that I know, the words that I grew up with as a boy, words from the hills. The folklore word. You'll hear words like mama and papa, grandma and grandpa. Well, us kids in those hills, you never heard a kid say, go run in the house and say, mother, can I do this or that? It was always mama. We didn't run up to our fathers and say, Father, can I go here or there? It was always Papa. These are the words that I grew up with, and they're the only ones that I know how to use. I grew up in those hills on a little farm. This farm has been deeded to my mother. She's part Cherokee, back in the latter 1800s when the government chopped up the Cherokee Strip and deeded it out in allotments to those who could lay claim to the Cherokee heritage. My mother was part Cherokee. I even have a roll number myself. I was the only boy in the family at that time, but I had a whole house full of sisters, five of them. I never have thought that was fair, but there wasn't anything <laughs> I could do about it. And uh, like... Most country boys in those days, I didn't have any boys to run around with or play with. Neighbors were few and far between. And I was always alone. But the only friend I had was an old dog. And I couldn't play with my sisters. That was utterly impossible. You couldn't do that. They didn't live in the kind of a world that I lived in, they lived in what I called a girl's world. This is a world, a wonderful world for girls. Playhouses, corn shuck dolls, and mud pies, and what have you. Now this didn't interest me as a boy. I was interested in the outdoors, hunting and fishing. And I don't think I've ever had all of it I wanted in my life. We didn't have any way to get an education there in those hills. It, it was oh, terrible in a way. My first schooling was when Mama sent off 
and ordered six little blackboards. And she'd set us kids down on the floor, and this is mostly in the wintertime, and she taught us how to write our names on that little, those little blackboards and how to add a few figures. That was my first schooling. And Mama said I was about nine years old when they finally, we didn't even have a schoolhouse at the time. That tickled me to death. I didn't want to go to school anyhow. <laughs> Mama said I was about nine years old when the little community began to kind of settle up and they decided they'd build a schoolhouse. Well, when they built this schoolhouse, they did me a wonderful favor. They built it across the river from where I live and there was no bridge across the river. <laughs> the only way that my sisters and I could attend the little school, we had to wade the river. We could only go to school in the summer. The summer months, it was impossible to go in the winter. But I can remember so well that Mother would fix our lunch in a great big old bucket. And she'd give it to my oldest sister, Gladys. Then she'd give her a lariat rope. And we'd go down through our field and climb over the rail fence, and we had a little trail that twisted its way down through the river bottoms and the cane breaks to the river. And right below a deep hole of water, there was a riffle. Now, this was a small stream. The water on that riffle, none of us kids can ever remember it being over 8 or 10, 12 inches deep, and we were always barefooted in the summer. But the reason Mama gave Gladys that old rope was in the spring of the year when the snows would melt and the rains would come, that little river would get all over those bottoms, wide, deep, muddy, and swift. And in that country, we had a fine white gravel in the bottom of our streams. And this swift water would wash potholes out on that riffle. Some of them were pretty deep. And this is why Mama gave Gladys that old rope. On reaching the river, she tied around the waist of us little ones and holding the bucket of lunch in one hand and the rope in the other while she'd lead us across that riffle. The water in the little Illinois River there was always crystal clear. And she could see those dark holes on that riffle. She'd weed us around, weave us through them. On the other side, she'd hang that old rope up on the limb of a tree and we'd go on up to the little schoolhouse. The teacher didn't get paid anything. And they, we never had the same teacher over a few days, week or 10 days at a time. The way they worked it, the mothers took turn about teaching us kids in that little schoolhouse. We didn't get much, but I'm thankful for what we did get. You know, not long after the publication of Red Fern, we had a kind of a family reunion and I still have five sisters and two brothers living. And during this reunion, we was laughing and talking about how we had to live so long ago in those hills and how poor we were and how we had to go to school. And I happened to remember that every time we went to school, Gladys always tied me right on the end of that rope. <laughs> every time. And I asked her, I said, Gladys, how come when we went to school up there in those hills, you always tied me on the end of that rope? She tied the girls right behind her, and my spot was right on the end of it. She laughed, and she says, you know, Bud, I've thought about that a thousand times since those days. She said, I always figured that if I had to lose one, I wanted it to be you. LAUGHTER